Welcome back to Parking Full Time. I'm Big Dave the Parker. This is the third Bible study and prayer time video in our Titus Philemon series for summer and fall of 2022. The goal of Parking Full Time is to display the glory of God's creation by visiting every state park, national park, and national forest in the contiguous 48 states. But the God who created this world is also the God who sent his son Jesus to die for our sins, pay the death payment for sin that we couldn't pay, and save this world. And that's what these Bible study and prayer time videos are designed to highlight. In this video, I want to look at the last part of Titus chapter 1. We've already done two videos in Titus. This is the third one. And so I want to look at the last part of Titus chapter 1. And so let's look at Titus chapter 1, verses 10 through 16. That's what we're going to focus on tonight. And as usual, I like to go and read the text to get an overview of the text, and then we'll start digging into the details. So Titus chapter 1, starting in verse 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, slow beasts, evil bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. This passage starts with the word for, and that's one of those linking words that I talk about all the time. Uh, it means that what comes after is an elaboration or explanation of what came before. And so if I look back to verse 9, the last phrase here in verse 9 is convince the gainsayers. That's really what we're talking about here in the last part of Titus chapter 1. Uh, we're talking about um, the gainsayers, who they are, what they need to be convinced of, and how Titus, and indirectly us, should go about doing that. Um, as we'll see in the details of the text that we're getting ready to study here, uh, the gainsayers are not just run-of-the-mill unbelievers. They're people who are intentionally damaging the work and the body of Christ, intentionally damaging believers. And the reason they're doing it is by using God's people for their own material gain, for their own money and their own power. Um, that's why they're called the gainsayers. Uh, the things that they are saying are, they're saying them to believers, to, but they're doing it for, they're saying those things for their own gain, their own material gain. Uh, if you've been saved for any length of time, you're going to run into these gainsayers. Uh, people who claim to have your best spiritual interests at heart, but really all they care about is their gain. All they really care about is their money and their power. Uh, I think uh, the prosperity gospel preachers fall into this category of gainsayers. Uh, they'll tell you, well, give us all your money and God will open up the windows of heaven for you and make you rich and heal all your diseases. And then when that doesn't happen, they say, well, it's your fault. You didn't have enough faith in God. So they lied to people, lie to the people for their personal gain to get their money. And that's the kind of people that they're talking about here. That's the kind of people that Paul's talking about when he talks about the gainsayers. And I can tell you from personal experience, because I've run into these kind of people, uh, if you believed in Jesus, you're going to run into the gainsayers at some point. Now, if you haven't believed in Jesus, now's a great time to do that. Uh, it'll mean eternal life for you. You see, we've all sinned. We've all done things that God has told us not to do and failed to do things that God has told us to do. And the Bible tells us that the penalty for that sin is death. But it goes on to say the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. 
And if you've done that, if you believed in him, if you believed in Jesus, uh, you're going to run into these gainsayers. And they're going to try to do their saying to get financial gain from you. You don't want to let them do that. So in this video, I want to look at who the gainsayers are and what Paul tells Titus and indirectly us to do about them. So let's get into the text here. The first two verses in this text, they talk about who the gainsayers are and what they're doing. So let's look at verses 10 and 11. Uh, verse 10, it says, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses. When it talks about whole houses there, uh, in, Paul's days, in Paul's day, churches didn't meet in separate buildings, uh, set apart for the house of the Lord like we typically do in the United States today. In Paul's day, churches met in someone's house. So he's talking about subverting whole houses. He's really talking about what we would say today, subverting whole churches, subverting whole entire groups of believers. And here's what they're doing. They're teaching things, these gainsayers, they're teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake, that is, for money's sake. In these two verses here, there's really just a bunch of ugly stuff here. Um, it talks about being unruly. That means rebellious. Uh, rebellious against church leaders and ultimately rebellious against God. Uh, there's vain talkers. Uh, this refers to talk that lacks meaning, to nonsense. Uh, word salad might be a way that we call it today. A few months ago, I was listening to a well-known preacher on TV. I won't give his name because you could easily look it up and you'd probably recognize it. And as I was listening, at first I thought, oh, that's really good. He'd make another point. Oh, that's good. He'd sprinkle in a verse of scripture every now and then. Then he got to the end. I thought, well, wait a minute. Now, what did he just say? What did that really mean? It sounded good, but really it was just meaningless nonsense. It was just the world's philosophy with a few scriptures mixed in to sound make it to make it sound biblical. And when you listen to these people, when you listen to these vain talkers, their words sound good. But when you think a little bit, think about what those words actually mean, especially in light of scripture, especially in light of what God says, those words are really just meaningless nonsense. And that was the case with the gainsayers. They were vain talkers. Uh, it tells us they were also deceivers. Um, they were trying to lead unsuspecting and untaught believers astray. Uh, that's one reason it's really important to be part of a good church, uh, to be a physical member of a physical local church. Um, if you're well taught in the scriptures, it, it, it's harder, not impossible, but a lot harder for gainsayers to deceive you. Uh, it tells us they were of the circumcision. That means they were Jewish Christians. But the main thing is here in verse 11, uh, it says, whose mouth must be stopped, who subvert whole houses. But here's the main thing about them, the main thing that they were doing. They were teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. That is, teaching things they ought not, teaching things that were false. And they were doing it for their unjust enrichment, for their personal financial gain. You see, financial gain is never the right motivation for serving God. Uh, Jesus warned about these things. Let me write down a reference here. And the reference I'm going to write down is Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. Okay? Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. We'll turn back there and we'll look at that. Jesus gives a warning about the love of money, doing the warning about doing things for filthy lucre's sake. For the sake of just your personal financial gain. So we want to look at Luke chapter 12. Sorry, my pages are sticking together. There we go. Uh, Luke chapter 12. So this is the uh, Gospel of Luke. And we're going to look down at chapter 12. And I want to look at verses 13 through 21. So we'll go down here to the bottom of the next page. Uh, Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. And so here's the teachings of Jesus on uh, doing things for filthy lucre's sake. So a couple of people approach him here uh, and says, And one of the company said unto him, said unto Jesus, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. 
And he, Jesus, said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? So he refuses to do that. And then notice what he says to him here. Notice verse 15. And he said unto him, Take heed, so listen to this. What I'm about to tell you is really important. And beware of covetousness. Beware of wanting things and wanting material things that other people have. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And then Jesus elaborates on that. You see the word and here. So that means this is a continuation of what we just read. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. I have no place to store all of this money I have, all of these things that I have. And so here's what he decides. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thy knees, eat, drink, and be merry. Just go and have a good time. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. Uh, material things are important for us while we're here. We all need food. We all need shelter. We all need clothing. Uh, we, we need water. There are physical things that we need, but these physical things only last for a while. And both of these people that Jesus deals with here, the uh, man back in verse 13 uh, the man who uh, wanted him to speak to his brother to divide the inheritance with him. Uh, both that person and also this rich man down at the second part that we read here. Um, both of these people, they come to Jesus um, looking for money. The man in verse 13 was looking for an inheritance. In Jesus' response to him, he says, Beware of covetousness. Beware of loving or desiring earthly possessions, in particular money. The rich man, in verses 16 through 21, he wanted to build bigger barns so he could get even richer, store even more stuff. And notice what God says here to him. He says to him, thou fool. Uh, this rich man, he probably looked really wise to the world, to people in the world, for being able to accumulate so much wealth. But he's not wise in the eyes of God. God calls him a fool. And look, we all need physical things. We need things like food, clothing, shelter. Uh, those things are important while we're here on earth. But enough is enough. Financial gain is never the right reason for serving God. Back in the book of Titus, we move now from who the gainsayers are and what they were doing to what we need to do about and that starts in verses 12 through 14. Okay, so let's look in, uh, uh, starting in, well, starting in verse 11 and then looking at really at verses 12 through 14 here. Uh, verse 11 says, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses. So it says they have to be stopped. Um, we can't just go and tolerate the error and hope things will work out. No, th these gainsayers, they have to be stopped. They're doing damage. And then he elaborates on that in verse 12 here. So he says, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. And Paul comments on that. And he says, this witness is true. What they say, that's correct. That's an accurate characterization of these gainsayers. And then so wherefore, so as a result of who they are and what they're doing, wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. Uh, and that's the main thing. That's the main thing here. He says, rebuke them sharply. That's the main thing that he tells Titus to do with these gainsayers. Uh, when we think of a sharp rebuke, we sometimes uh, mistakenly think of you know, getting in their face and bringing a railing accusation against them. Um, that's really not the idea. The idea is really back here in verse 9. The idea is to convince the gainsayers. Uh, if we get in their face and bring a railing accusation against them, I, it might make us feel good, and some of the things we say might even be right. But it's not going to convince anyone. So when Paul says here, when he says rebuke them sharply, what he means, he means to convince them, 
to reason with them out of the scriptures. Sometimes that works. Some people will listen to reasoning from the scriptures. Some people won't. Some people, when you show them what God says about something, when you show them the scriptures, uh, some people try to come up with some intellectual argument to justify what they're doing and therefore refuse to uh, refuse the truth that the scripture conveys. Now, Paul also tells Titus what to do when that happens, um, but not until chapter 3, so we'll get to that here in a few weeks. But I want you to notice here, the purpose of this rebuke, the purpose of rebuking them sharply, isn't just to make them feel bad or isn't just to make them look foolish, although it might do that. The purpose here is at the end of verse 13, that they may be sound in the faith, that they may be sound in the faith. Uh, the purpose is not to push them away or tear them down. The purpose is to build them up, to make them sound in the faith. Uh, let me give you a reference for that. It's uh, 2 Corinthians um, chapter 13 and verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 10. Um, Paul deals with a, a slightly different situation, but another situation where he has to give this kind of rebuke. So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And we'll look at verse 10. So this is 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And look at what he tells them here in verse 10. He says, Therefore I write these things being absent. Uh, he's not with the church at Corinth right now. He's away from them. He's absent from them. Therefore I write these things being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord hath given me. But notice this here, to edification, that is to building up and not to destruction. You see, the purpose in anything we do, whether it be the kind of teaching that I'm doing right now, or whether it be um, the kind of rebuke that has to be given occasionally, the purpose of this is not to destroy people. It's not to tear people down. The purpose is to edify them, to build them up, uh, to make them stronger in the faith so that they can serve the Lord better and be closer to the Lord, to do a better job at saying what God says and doing what God says to do. That's the purpose of any teaching. It's also the purpose of any rebuke, any sharpness that we have to use. The purpose is to edify, to build people up, not to destroy them. Now, back in Titus, we're down to the last two verses of the chapter here. And the last two verses of chapter 1 uh, gives a more general principle about spiritual purity as it relates to the things that we do. And so let's look at these two verses here. Look at uh, verse 15. <clears throat> In verse 15, Paul writes, Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and their conscience is defiled. Uh, Paul's dealing with the issue of spiritual purity here. Spiritual purity for the pure, that is for believers, for people who have believed in Jesus. And then also spiritual purity or the lack thereof and the need thereof for the defiled, that is for the unbelieving, people who haven't believed in Jesus. Um, Paul gives some nice language here. Um, Jesus deals with the same issue, though, the same issue of purity in a more concrete way. And so let's go look at that. Um, let's go look at um, Luke. Uh, chapter 7, verses 15 through 23. Luke chapter 7, verses 15 through 23. Or, sorry, I said Luke, I meant Mark. I'm sorry about that. Mark chapter 7, verses 15 through 23. Uh, Jesus talks about um, purity, but he talks about it in a more concrete way, uh, in a more specific way. So let's look at that. Mark chapter 7, verses 15 through 23. This is Mark chapter 7, and look what Jesus says here uh, in verse 15. Uh, Mark chapter 7, verse 15, Jesus says, There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. The way Paul says this here is, To the pure, all things are pure. 
So what he's telling me here is once I've trusted in Christ, once I have trusted in his sacrifice to purify me, to pay for my sins, then there's nothing that I can do. There's nothing from without me that can come in that will defile me. There's nothing I can do that will make me a defiled sinner in the sight of God again. Once God cleans you up, that's it. That's all the cleaning you're ever going to need. And it's a real comfort and blessing once you understand that. Once you understand that once God has purified me, once he has come in and done the cleaning that he does on the inside when we believe in him, uh, once he's done that, that there is nothing from without a man that entering in that can defile him. Nothing can go in and defile me, make me a defile sinner in the sight of God again. And it's a real blessing once you understand that. So this is Jesus' way of saying to the pure, all things are pure. Um, but he also talks about the other side of it, the defiled side. And so let's skip down here, down to verse 20, Mark chapter 7, verse 20. Okay. And so uh, continuing along this line, he says, uh, that, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, we talked about covetousness before, wickedness, deceit, Titus chapter 1 also mentions deceit, a lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile the man. See, the point Jesus is trying to make here, um, evil is not something that lives out in the sinful world and seeps into us over time, it's the exact opposite. Evil starts within us. It starts within our heart, the center of our being. And over time, out of the heart of men, as he says here in verse 21, over time, out of the heart of men, this evil seeps out in the form of things that we do. All of these evil things he mentions here, evil thoughts, uh, adultery, sexual sins, fornications, uh, murders, uh, thefts, covetousness, desiring material things. Uh, it's what the gainsayers were doing that we were, that were talking about uh, in Titus chapter 1. And so his point here is, if the problem is internal, if the problem is in my heart, if all of these evil things come out of my heart, there's no external ritual or action I can do that will fix the problem inside of me. Okay? It just doesn't work. You can go and wash out your mouth with soap, um, but that doesn't clean up the inside. It doesn't clean up the heart from which all of these evil things come. Only God can clean up the inside. And he does that when we believe in him. So to the pure, to those of us who believed in him, all things are pure. Nothing can make us evil sinners again, as he says in verse 15. But to the defiled, to the unbelievers, they have all these things here in their heart, and there's nothing you can do on the outside that's going to clean that up. The only thing we can do to clean that up is to believe in Jesus and let him clean up the inside. That's the only solution for that particular problem, the problem that is in the heart, the problem that is on the inside. Now, back in Titus, we've got one more verse to look at here, and then we'll go into the, uh, start to wrap this up. <clears throat> the last verse in Titus chapter 1, uh, verse 16, is a practical application of this principle. To the principle, then, to the pure, all things are pure, but to unbelievers, nothing is pure. Nothing's going to purify them other than believing in Jesus. And so let's look at the practical application and how this manifests itself in practice. So look at verse 16. It says, they, again referring to the gainsayers, referring to the people who are defiled, the unbelieving, to whom nothing can clean up other than believing in Jesus. Verse 16, he says, they profess that they know God. With their mouths, they say they know God. Uh, if you asked them today, they'd say, yeah, I'm a Christian. But in works, they deny him. In terms of what they do, the, what they do says they don't know God. And then an elaboration on that being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. Uh, I've mentioned before in the first couple of videos in this series, 
uh, the phrase good work, that is the key phrase in the book of Titus. That's why I boxed it there uh, from when we studied the first part of chapter 1. So Paul says that even though they say they know God, um, to every good work, they are reprobate. Um, the word reprobate there, it carries the idea of being unfit, of having been given a test, but having failed that test. As a retired math professor, I know about people failing tests, unfortunately. Um, a few semesters ago, I had a student email me after final grades were assigned. He said, well, can't you just give me a C? And I answered in kinder and gentler language that no, the grade you got, it was actually a lot closer to an F than it was to a C. So you failed too many tests. As a final thought before we hit our prayer time here, uh, there's a related passage to uh, being to what he says here about being reprobate to every good work, to being unfit for every good work. And that related passage is 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. I'm going to write that reference here in here, and then we'll go and take a look at it. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. He says some things about being reprobate to every good work. So let's go and look at that here. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And let's look at the very end of the chapter, verses 24 through 27. And Paul writes to them here, he says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. Uh, know ye not is one of the key phrases in the book of 1 Corinthians. It appears over and over again in 1 Corinthians. So he, Paul references this thing, this thing that they should know, based on what the church of Corinth was doing. It wasn't clear that they did know this, but it's something they should know. He says, don't you know this? And he says, don't you know that everybody runs in the race, but only one receives the prize. There's only one winner. And he says, so run. This is the way you should run that ye may obtain. And then a different illustration, a different way of saying the same thing. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. Uh, people who are running a physical race or fighting a physical fight, they're doing it to obtain um, a physical medal. We don't do it to obtain a physical medal. We do it to obtain an incorruptible crown. And in his conclusion here, he says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. The Greek word translated castaway here at the very end of verse 27 is the same one translated reprobate in Titus chapter 1 and elsewhere in the New Testament. So Paul himself says that if he doesn't train himself to serve Christ, um, that he, can, he himself can preach to others, that is, he can profess to know God, but become a castaway, that is, become a reprobate, become unfit for good works, and therefore miss the prize or reward that God has for him. So my final exhortation in this video is don't just profess only, don't just say that you know God, actually know God, and let that come out in your good works. Be fit for good works. See, God has given us everything that we need to serve him. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He has cleaned us up on the inside. He does that when we believe. Uh, he's given us, uh, he's adopted us as his children. And he's given us a bunch of other things. He's given us forgiveness. He's given us an inheritance. So if we miss the prize, if we, if we aren't fit for good works, it's not his fault. It's our fault. Because we chose not to use the things that he's given us to do good works. And so I hope you can say what Paul says here tonight. I hope you can say that I keep under my body and I bring it into subjection. I hope you can say that you're not just running a race, not just fighting a fight. I hope you can say you're running a good race. I hope you can say you're fighting a good fight. So that, lest when I have preached to others, when I profess to know God, I myself should become unfit for any good works. We'll pick up with Titus chapter 2 next week. For now, I want to close this video with a brief uh, prayer time. Uh, so here's my prayer list here. 
You can email prayer requests to parkingfulltime at gmail.com. I'm not going to promise that I'll read every prayer request that I get there and add it to this list, um, but I will if it's appropriate to do so. And so here are a few things I'm praying for. So first of all, I'm praying for our country and its leaders. I think that's desperately needed right now. I'm praying for furtherance of the gospel and for people who preach it. And I'm praying for believers to grow, for believers to grow in their ability and their doing of good works, as Titus says, uh, as Paul says in Titus. And so those are some things I'm praying for. And so at this time, I'm going to cut this video. And so until next time, uh, let's take a few minutes to pray now. Until next time, I am Big Dave the Parker for Parking Full Time. Have a great afternoon. Take care. And Lord bless.